Hey, this is Stephanie Flates here with creatingwithin.com and I want to welcome you to a mini candid conversation with Bill Passman. He's a gentleman I met during my travels in Lisbon, Portugal, and I found his story to be interesting and inspiring. And I wanted to share it with you guys in hopes that it will inspire you to move into the direction of your dreams and your desire and to know that it's never too late to start moving in the direction of the things that you truly want. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Please listen to it with headsets on. There's a lot of background noise, and I apologize for that. But nonetheless, it's a good conversation, and I hope you get what you need out of it. Welcome. I wanted to talk to you about your journey and how you decided to leave everything behind, leave the conventional life of uh, America and the rat race, and um, travel the world. You shared with me that you were a lawyer. That's correct. And you were making two hundred thousand. Yeah, sometimes that you know, sometimes you spend more than you make. <laughs> what inspired you to? What what kind of triggered the? I'm gonna leave everything behind and I'm gonna just travel. Sure. Uh, I'm really not positive exactly if there was one instance, but I woke up one day at 51 years old, and I'd been working as a lawyer, making money, spending more money traditional American way, bigger cars, bigger house, more things. Didn't actually have any money saved in the bank, no assets per se. But I woke up one morning uh, and realized that my plan to travel had never happened. I still didn't have a passport 51. So I actually Googled what to do 51 and over and over it kept popping up climb Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. It seems to be the one thing people do when they get 50. So I bought a ticket. I did some research first. It was very expensive from the States. So I started researching. I found a company in Tanzania that would do the Kilimanjaro site for $4,000 less than what it would be in the U.S. So I bought a ticket, told my three sons I was going. They thought I was joking. Mm. Uh, so, off I went, and I climbed all the way to the top of Kilimanjaro, which was 5895 meters or 19,340 feet, which is pretty high for someone from Louisiana that has no mountains. And, I don't know, everything changed by the time you get to the top of Kilimanjaro at daylight and you see the entire, you're in the roof of Africa. And then the next few days I went to the Serengeti and the Safari and I went to the Ngorgora Crater to see all the beautiful animals. And at this point you had already left your job? No, no. I, I just took a little... A break. Break. And when I came back, I already, before I even got finished with that journey, I started thinking of other places I wanted to go. I've never been to Europe. So I started planning actually to climb a second mountain. The second, well, Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa. So Mount Ebus, Elvis, in uh, uh, Russia is actually the second, it's the highest in what's called Europe. So I thought maybe I'll start climbing the highest mountains on each continent. So I booked a flight to Munich, and then I was going to do a connecting flight to climb that mountain. But they had some problems with the Chechen rebels, so I couldn't climb. So I had a flight to Munich, and I decided to do two months in Europe by URL. And I'd never done backpacking before. So I knew I didn't have enough money saved to do traditional hotels. So I stayed in hostels. But I stayed in private rooms and I still spent 80 US a night. So I spent $12,000 in two months. Seeing all the sites of Europe. After that trip, I realized that I didn't want to work anymore. And I sold everything I had. And I also realized that I had to learn to travel cheaper. I looked everywhere for books that essentially tell you how to do it. There are guidebooks that show you certain things, but there was no just step-by-step -step thing saying, this is how to travel cheaper. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started writing my book, uh, Backpacking Around the World, on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just to provide people that have never traveled before with an easy guide to learn how to travel cheaply. And the more I traveled, the more of an obsession it became, and it just became a way of life. So, as I was beginning my travels, I started getting rid of things. 
you know, I already quit my job. Um, How did that feel? It was, it was scary at first. I mean, you know, I, I had some rental property that provided some income, and I was, but I was I had it all for sale at the time. So uh, when I started traveling full time, I didn't have a home anymore. I got rid of my car. I had any furniture. Mm. And the more things I got rid of, I'd either sell them or I would uh, give them away. And it just became such an enlightening feeling. I mean, I was, you know, get high school mementos that people treasure all their life. They only look at them once every 10 years. Yeah. But I had, you know, closets for stuff, and I'm like, why do I have all this stuff? So how do, how do, you, how do you see things now versus, like, when you had the traditional lifestyle? As I, as I say in my book, that there's nothing wrong with wanting to have things, especially when you're young, you've never had a house, you know, you have to raise a family for many people. They want good things for their family. It's just a matter of getting caught up with uh, being better than the Joneses next door, or having the bigger BMW than they have. You know, most people in like New Zealand use their automobile to go to work. They don't use it as a status symbol. So, learning that that money can buy you things to take care of your family is good, but to have it just to show off is a waste of resources. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't tell people that they shouldn't go out and have things. Of course. I'm just saying that, you know, spending two hundred dollars a month for cable and then saying that you don't have the money to travel doesn't make any sense. It's priorities. Priorities. It's all about priorities. So if you want to travel, you know, drive an older car, you know, have a cheaper phone, you know, have a live in a less a fluent neighborhood, you know, or something like that. So just choose what's most important to you. Nice. And through your travels, um, and just just it's a completely different lifestyle. What is one uh, perspective or lesson that you can share with people? What's something that you've obviously you've learned a lot along the way, but if there's like a couple of things that stands out in your mind that has really changed your whole outlook. I think that visiting all the different countries and the different cultures and watching people that don't have anything, that, to see how happy they are, mm -hmm. you know. I've seen children in Nepal hiking up some of the highest mountains, three, four years old, carrying water buckets with the biggest smile on their face. They're not upset like some American children because they don't have iPhone 5S, they have iPhone 5. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they can't go to the latest movie or they don't have more material possessions. So, uh, so do you think that they're happier? Oh, I, absolutely. I think they're happier. I think they're just, they're happy to have what they have. And I think that, especially in our culture, we're spoiled, you know, that we get all these things and you want your children to have the best, but the best doesn't mean having more material possessions. It means giving them a better quality of life. So, I think that uh, that also kind of, uh, my decision to kind of give up everything was proven by seeing everybody else traveling around the world and realizing people, people, people say, Bill, you travel all over the world, but you don't have any money. Because I didn't save any money. I, even the things I sold, uh, I didn't have a lot of money. That's important to know, because I think a lot of people, um, even myself, when I first decided to do this, the first thing you focus is, I don't, I don't have money, I can't do this. Right. It's, but I feel like, and especially now traveling, where there's a will, there's a way, and things always kind of come together. That's true. And I, I mean, I mean, I have never had over twenty thousand dollars in the bank, and that was just recently when I sold my last property. Most of the time I've traveled, I've had less than two thousand dollars in the bank. Oh wow! And I had a small, maybe four or five hundred dollars of coming in of income from some rental property until I finally sold it last year. But that was never concerned. You know, it was. When I was running low on money, I would go to Asia or Central America and stay there. But you never cheap. worried about it? I never worried about See, it. See, I think that's a big key for people is to focus on, because I'm a firm believer that the things that you focus on yeah. is what you create. So if you're worried about not having enough, then you'll create a lack of in your... I meet lots of travelers, uh, especially in Central America, that uh, come there with almost nothing. And they'll find a job uh, working in a hospital for a free room and board. Uh, working in a bar for, you know, uh, just a little extra cash. Uh, 
living simply, you know. And every one of them, I've never met any unhappy people that are doing that. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with packing. Uh, I try to get all my travelers that follow me now because I have the tour company to help um, my travels. I try to get them to take less and less every time. It's a carry-on bag only. Mm -hmm. And I've never ever had anybody said I didn't pack enough stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm teaching them in baby steps how to travel less expensive and with less stuff. With less stuff, yeah, exactly. A smaller imprint on the world. Yeah. I wanted you to share with us your how your tattoo came about, which I know has been something which I didn't even know obviously when I met you. Sure. We, we've been rooming and I had no idea yeah. of all the stuff that you were doing, but Yeah. Well, I never had a tattoo even until 2010, and like I said, my first passport was in 2006. That's crazy, that was the first time you ever started first traveling. First time I ever traveled, and the first place was to Africa, Tanzania. Uh, since then, I've been to all seven continents. Uh, I've been to 80 plus countries, I don't know, I don't, I don't keep up with the number. No, we just gotta look at your map. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, the tattoo, I think when I was, traveling in Thailand and saw so many tattoos and I saw tattoo places, I, I always thought that would be interesting to have a travel tattoo. It's something I never thought of, but you know, I'm much older now and I, you know, it's not like I be teaching my, my children something that maybe I shouldn't teach them. So I thought of the idea in 2008 in Thailand, but in 2010, I was in Antigua, Guatemala, and I met a girl from the U uh, UK, and her name was Jules. And I ran into her later in Honduras on Utila, and saw that she had a tattoo of the entire world on her back, but just the outline. So no, no countries. And I asked her where she got it, and she said, in Antigua, Guatemala. And she said she's going to put a red dot everywhere she went. So as she left, I'm drinking my beer thinking, if I put every country there and actually colored in every country according to the National Geographic map, that would really be cool. So I went back to Antigua and I went to the same guy and I said, uh, you did this tattoo for Jules, can you do every country? He says, how much room do I have? I said, well, you can use all of my back. He said, okay. He said, it'll take it. He said, can you do the pain? I said, I never had a tattoo. So we did it. It took about two, two and a half hours. I got it through it barely. Mm -hmm. A funny, a funny, a quick funny story is that uh, I didn't look at it. If he did, he he covered it up and uh, told me to wash it the next morning. And so I went and washed it the next morning. And then I'm looking in the in the hospital in the mirror at my tattoo for the first time. And then I went, oh crap! He put New Zealand on the wrong side of Australia. So I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? I've got to go back to, you know, well, and then it hit me. I was looking in a mirror. Oh, so you're looking in a mirror. It was all reversed. So, luckily, I didn't go back and start raising a big ruckus about you this. You messed it up. Yeah, no. You messed it up. It's like, what are you talking about? And now the thing that your tattoo is, so that people know, is that every country that you've been in, you every time that you you visit a place, you fill it in. Right. I, I do. And I don't do it in that country. Some people have asked me that. But in many countries, I would not get any medical work or anything, put any needle in me. But, uh, yeah, I do it the same place in, uh, in Louisiana. You oh, know. nice. So, and in the tattoo, I did the, the blog uh, just for my own personal use, for the progression to show how it would go. And so I set up this blog, and it had a counter on it with, I think, 200 family and friends had looked at it over two years. Mm -hmm. And then one day I saw my back on the internet. And I was like, how can that be? So I went back to my blog and there were 70,000 people that had been doing it. So I didn't even know you could find blogs like that. Mm -hmm. And then people from the UK, the Daily Mail, contacted me and said, we want to do an article. And they did an article. So everything's been manifesting. Like things just happen without you even trying. Because this, none of these things were things that you were looking for. Exactly. They just happened because you followed. You had a desire and you yes. followed through with it. 
Yeah. And <clears throat> this is like my whole point of doing interviews. Um, you know, I love to get stories from people because I think it's the best illustration to show people that really when you just follow the things you want to do and stop worrying about security and how you're going to make things happen, things just unfold. Like wow. they have a way you can never figure out how it's going to happen. And you never knew like how you were going to make the money, but it all came together. You started a tour company. It wasn't your intention. Yeah. And but it's it still happened. Not a job. It's still not, but it provides you and you're able to travel. It's like all the pieces that you needed to continue yeah. to support you on this path have, um, have come I have, together. I have found that people that have done that, made the big move or whatever. I've seen a lot of people from New Zealand, Australia come to Central America and start helping children, it, just donating their time. With helping children for local local schools and things like that, but then it turns into a job mm -hmm. that they actually feel really good about. You know, they're out making a difference in the world instead of going back making more money for the bigger house. Yeah. So, and they're like so happy. The people, especially in Guatemala, which is my favorite country, I've seen people come there for three months, and they're still there five years later. Well, uh, there's a quote that I have uh, that I've seen many times. This is, live the life you've dreamed. If, if you can dream to do that, why not put that first? Mm -hmm. Try it. If it doesn't work, we'll try it again. But don't give up on your hopes and, and go and work as a car salesman because your dad owns the car dealership and that's what he wants you to do and he says it'll make you you'll make a safe living like that. Another one of my sayings is that ships are safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. Yeah, you gotta sell them. So, especially when you're young, you've got your whole life to, to change and, and develop into that. And like I was telling you earlier, it's like, I wish I had done this travel when I was earlier, because until you've seen the world and seen all there is, you actually don't know who you are as a person. Because if you're just sitting at home in your small town area and everybody around you is your family telling you what you like and what you don't like, how are you going to know exactly what you do like? Uh, maybe you don't like scrambled eggs every day that your mother gave you. Maybe it's just something you're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Go out to China and find out what they eat, you know? And also, I mean, like I said, if I have my Facebook account is under Bill Passman and anybody can, can send me a Facebook request because it's 99.9% .9 travel related and I have like 1,500 Facebook friends, uh, probably a thousand from South America that follow me because of my tattoo. But all young people who are excited about the idea that it's not about making money, it's about understanding yourself and seeing the world and becoming a different person. And so I try to help anyone I can who's interested in, in maybe pursuing travel and things like that, I'll, you know, I'll give them free advice. It's just send me a message and I'll do my best, you know. Obviously, yeah. I don't know everything, but I'd be glad to give them what knowledge I have. What does your family think about your lifestyle? The, the first few years I started traveling, when I just quit everything, they, they, they thought I'd lost my mind. They really have. And even my brother, who's a lawyer, also kept saying, come back and practice law, come back and practice law, we can make so much money. I'm like, well, but I do that money. <laughs> it's kind of the story. Oh, yeah, can you share story. that story? Sure, <laughs> uh, I'll give you that. That'll be a good ending. I'll, I'll tell you the quick story. Uh, I heard this story when I was traveling to Asia, and someone said that there's a fisherman that lives in uh, Thailand, and every morning he would go to fishing, and he would fish for two hours a day, and he would catch enough fish to feed his family, to buy them whatever they needed and provide a good life for his wife and his children. After those two hours, he would play with his children every morning. In the afternoon, he would take a nap with his wife. In the evening, he would have family and friends over and they would sing and dance and enjoy their company. He did this every day. And a businessman had watched him for several months and he approached him and says, do you understand how many fish you could catch if you would fish all day? He said, what would I do with these fish? He said, well, you could hire more people and buy more boats, catch more fish. He's like, and then what? 
He said, in five years, you have enough money, you can open up a cannery here on the island, ship these fish worldwide. He's like, and then what would I do? He said, in 10 years, you'll be such successful that American businessmen will pay you millions and millions of dollars for this cannery. He's like, well, then what? He said, then you'll be able to afford to live in a beautiful fishing village like this, fish for two hours in the morning, play with your children. <laughs> so it just goes to show you that you know, having more things does not make you any happy. Maybe you already have the life that you want. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can, um, before we wrap it up, can you show us your tattoo? Sure. So cool. Yeah, I've been to Greenland, but I haven't colored it yet. Yeah, there's a and couple of places you've been to that you haven't colored it up yet. That's awesome. Well, thank you. You're welcome.